Okay, we're going to um, move on with the next session. Uh, this is still under economy and business. This is taking advantage of UFB infrastructure and the sartorially resplendent host this evening, or this afternoon rather, is Paul Brisland, the uh, CEO of Two Ends. So he's going to run the session for you. Hope you enjoy it. How are you all? Are you all scattered for a reason? Can you come on in a bit closer so we can... No, go on. You like it there? All right. No, fair enough too. Excuse me, I've just started scoffing a mint. I wasn't quite expecting to go quite so soon. Ultra-fast broadband. It seems like a very long time since we started talking about ultra-fast broadband, probably because it is a very long time since we started talking about it. Uh, my hope is that we are getting close to seeing it actually, actually start to uh, have an impact on the environment. Um, uh, we're sort of, yeah, we're, we're getting to the starting line is, is how I like to think of it. We're, we're very nearly there and pretty soon we can start to see the impacts of the UFB uh, on, on the telco infrastructure. But more importantly for me, coming from a users association, are the impacts on uh, the end users. If all we do with this thing is watch TV and get our email a bit quicker, we've really missed a trick. I think we'll have missed an opportunity to, um, to really have a step change in terms of New Zealand's economic future. And um, I was delighted to see David Shearer this morning talking uh, almost as haltingly as I am about uh, the future of New Zealand's economy uh, and uh, uh, referencing name-checking Sir Paul Callaghan because we had Paul Callaghan speak at a conference last year and uh, he really opened my eyes to the possibility of the UFB and what sort of things we could be doing. Uh, not the UFB alone, of course, and I think we can probably branch out a bit from just... Uh, our national intranet and start talking about international capacity as well at some point. But um, uh, there is a lot of potential and I think New Zealand is well placed to take advantage of the digital economy if only we can get started. So what I'd like to do is ask a few of you uh, to really take over and start talking about what you'd like to do with this thing because I'm just the guy who likes to cheerlead about it. Uh, I, I don't own a business or run a business uh, and I don't have any real plans to use it for anything other than what I do today. So I'm hoping some of you are going to do something a bit more interesting. Al, the man. <laughs> G'day. Um, so I'm from Scoop, and we run a content company. Um, at present, in terms of product, which is being coming out, um, there's, no, there's no unlimited bandwidth over the local loop. And... Unlimited bandwidth of the local loop at really high speeds would be revolutionary, but nobody's selling it. It's just mm. not available. I'd quite like to know why, and can that be changed? Uh, I think you'll find there are a couple of ISPs doing um, unlimited bandwidth. Um, at high speed. Uh, yep, yep. Where, uh, I saw... For example, I'll just give you an example. I've got, we have a five megabit office, yep. asynchronous connection, which is on fibre. I mean, why have we got a 5 megabit connection? Because that's like 600 bucks, and if we want 25 megs, then we're going to cost $1,500 or something. That's right, that's right. So, um, which, which, I mean, we don't, we don't need fibre for 5 megabits a second. We can do that on VDSL. We can. Uh, but what, you, what you've got, I guess, is point-to-point -point fibre versus what we're building, which is a, a GPON fibre network. Um, there's, there's presumably a whole host of reasons why yours is so expensive, not least of which is a lack of competition in that market. Hopefully, the UFB will be addressing that. We'll start to see. We, we, like we're in CBD Wellington, and mm. everybody's got fibre in our building. That's right. There's no lack of competition. So, so, where is, so, so what is the problem there, then? Why, who's, who have we got CityLink here? Who, who can I see? No, everybody's hiding. Or <laughs> FX? Have we got anybody from FX here? No, isn't that interesting? Calling Jamie. He's hiding outside. Come into the room, Outside, Jamie. Jamie. So, OK, well, well, since they're not here, we'll blame them. Um, uh, you know, a, a lack of uh, competition isn't necessarily based on the lack of capability or a lack of um, uh, accessibility. Uh, it's a lack of willingness to, to tackle the market and say, OK, well, you know, $600 is a ridiculous price. Let's make it $100. But, I mean, at a, at a residential level, if we mm. could... I mean, we've got you... If, I mean, Telstra is now selling... Um, you mean Voda? Yeah, Voda. Voda, <laughs> Voda Proto Voda um, is, is now selling... Proto Voda. Um, 100 megabits per second yep. connections in the house. So I can get a much, much faster connection at home, yep. at Rory... Than you can in the office. Than I can in my office yep. at a quarter of the price. That's right. So why don't I all, we, we should all just move home. 
Yeah, crazy, isn't it? And, and we should. We absolutely should. And you've got to remember that telcos are... Um, Russell Stanners will hate me for using this because I love stealing his line. Telcos are coin-operated. If you stop putting the money in, they stop annoying you. You can go elsewhere and get your service from someone else. And if it is a case of, well, we'd love to be in CBD Wellington, but sorry, we're all, uh, all going to work from home because um, uh, it's cheaper and we get a better product. And there is some question about whether you do or not, whether everybody working from home would then contend the network. Surely with fibre, we don't need to worry about that. I have a man waving a hand from, <laughs> from Radio New Zealand. More content producers. Yeah, having, having just been to market for fibre connectivity, there is competition. Mm. And I think it's probably safe to say that um, the people who respond to RFPs will eventually get the message if they lose out on price that, you know, they're charging too much money. Yep. And, and that's, that's really the only way we can, we can get them to shift, isn't it? Um, other than massive government investment from Rowan's lot to, uh, to build something new and shiny uh, to, to try and take that on. Because clearly 600 bucks a month for five megs a second is a, a wee bit silly. I mean, I, w I will point out this is in the CBD in Auckland and in Wellington. So, you know, it's... Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's quite critical as well, isn't it? Because uh, for the first time ever, I think, given the, the rate at which um, Whangarei is building fibre and ultra-fast fibre in the Waikato, uh, you're now reaching a point where it's actually going to be uh, faster and better internet access in Tokoroa than in Mount Eden. And that's really going to hopefully, I would hope, shake up a few people and make them realise that you don't actually have to live in central Auckland to run a, a business online. Uh, you know, if Dotcom's willing to run fibre out to the mansion uh, at its own cost, um, maybe there is hope for uh, rural and residential users in New Zealand. So what else are we going to do with it? Who else, is, uh, who else is planning to do something with the UFB, or are you just all going to get your pawn a wee bit quicker? There's a man at the back waving his hand. We just come from the cloud session very contentious statement. So, screw the crowd. We don't want the cloud. What we want is everyone has a very rich device that they have. The cloud is in your hand. Yep. You're synced between all of your devices at any time. <coughs> and if you have an incredibly fast access network, you don't need the cloud. The cloud is a product of having a, a synchronous point. What do people say to this? <laughs> so, so talk me through that. How does that work? Or you've got... Well, if you have an incredibly fast access network, yep. say gigabits to your cell phone, gigabit, gigabits to whatever media PC you've got in your house, um, and maybe a tablet or something else, or a laptop, then why do you need a cloud provider to give you access to all your content when you can sync it instantaneously between your stuff? And isn't that actually a much better thing? Because then you own your data. Oh, dangerous ground, owning your content. Oh, ooh, how will we make money charging you over and over again for all those windows of access to your content? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see, you know, it, my internet use over the last 10 years has changed from it being me sitting at a computer in my spare room to being uh, all members of my family at any stage of the day on any device, um, uh, soaking up the bandwidths as much as possible. It must be the puffles, I think, in, um, in, in, Cl in Club Penguin. They take up an awful lot of room. Um, so you said you don't want to talk about receiving TV. How about broadcasting TV Even from better. Home? That's right. Why is it that we're spending a fortune on TV and Z7? Oh, no, wait, we're not. Why is it we're spending a fortune on TV and Z and TV3 so that they can have licenses to broadcast things on certain spectrum when there's really no need to worry about broadcasting at all? We've all got access to uh, broadcast-capable uh, network even as we speak. Uh, and I'd like to see a lot more of that. I guess uh, we have to train up the consumers, though, as well, don't we, to, to um, break them of the habit of... Um, waiting for television to appear on TV and Z when they're good and ready for it. Um, and if only there was some kind of Pirate Bay way of doing that, I, you know, we'd probably be done to quite a good thing, wouldn't we? Well, instead of uploading stuff to YouTube, uh, if you had a gigabit connection at home, you could just run your own server at mm. home and stream your own video straight from home. That's right. I mean, storage being what it is, you know, you saw that, um, that photo on the first day of the, uh, what was it, a 5 meg um, uh, hard drive being loaded onto the aeroplane? Um, I've, got, I've got gigabytes of data here in my phone that you know, I, I never run out of capacity these days. Uh, so, yeah, micro, micro broadcasting. Is that what we'd call it? I quite like the sound of that. Yes. Okay, sort of following on from, from that. Um, 
couple of years ago, I was working with a gentleman who, who was running his own Mythbox, uh, mm. an, an open source TiVo-like device. Um, only he had his connected to uh, a satellite dish, which was basically yep. sucking down all the movies. So he was experiencing something where essentially he could decide what he wanted to watch when he wanted to watch it. And he didn't watch the adverts anymore. I think it's an interesting <laughs> where, where adverts are going these days. Yeah. Um, but it, the, the real theme here was that he had a choice. So, I mean, what, what's happening now is that rather than being just soaking up whatever mm. the, the, the TV networks want to give you... When they want to give it to you. When, when they want to give it to you. Yeah. Now we're actually getting to the point where the, the average man in the street can actually get a system to decide what they want to watch, when they want to watch it. That's and right. the UFB is what's going to be able to deliver it to them. Yeah. What we don't see at the moment is, I mean, we, we, we have tablets and, and computing devices and whatnot. We don't really have the, the set-top boxes and the standards which will <coughs> hook up the content companies mm. with those set-top boxes. And at the moment, the reason for that is that the broadcasting companies, the, the, the middlemen, um, they've got a lot of money invested in trying to control the content That's right. provision. And, and what I saw, and uh, I made a submission to government about this, that... What, what these middlemen will try and do is um, use DRM not to protect the content. The content really, in terms of tr protecting the content, they've always been a playing losing game That's there. Right. Yeah. What they're trying to do is protect the channel. Yeah, because yeah. if they lose control of the channel, you'll see what happened in the same thing that happened to music, is they lose control of the ability to control the distribution. To throttle. Like, That's yeah. right. Yeah. And so after that, then people can watch whatever they want when they want to watch it, Sort of like we do with YouTube at the moment, only, yep. only you know, better quality and better quality. Well, better, yeah. You know, but in terms of, um, you know, we don't all want to watch Pretty Little Kittens. Um, no, we do. Well, okay, we do. But don't tell us that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, so yeah. Kitten I mean, cam. the quality content needs to come on board. You know, and I'm yeah. thinking like David Attenborough movies for me. Um, and yeah, and, and it's starting to, isn't it? You know, we, I've got quick flicks on my iPad, so I can watch um, what meagre content there is that's available. So how much of this is tied up with uh, content rights being held in a mechanism which is designed around broadcast uh, versus Correct. the shiny new world of, of a la carte dining? So, so I think the problem here is that there's, uh, you know, do we really want to allow agreements? I see them as competitive, mm. uh, sorry, uh, anti-competitive, Agreements between the content companies and you know, people like Sky, the, 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 these type of kind of companies, who, by, by creating those exclusive agreements, you're basically tying it into one Limiting. mechanism or one device, right. um, rather than basically letting anyone purchase the, the content at will. Mm. Um, so are we big enough to be able to say to these content producers, we're not going to play your game anymore? Or is there this... I, I get the idea that there's this fear that we will simply be told, oh, well, you can't watch Game of Thrones then. We'll take it all away from you. Uh, you'll never have any television again. What, ha, ha. And, um, and we'll have to go back to watching Heartland or something similar. Shortland oh, Street, yeah. presumably. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, if it was only New Zealand, perhaps, then that would be true. But I right. think if, if, if this was a worldwide... Um, Decision essentially to say, well, we're going to break the, we're going to break the coupling between the content owners and the and the distributors, the, the distributors, yeah, yeah. and have some kind of uh, anti-competitive law, uh, like we do in other areas, um, in the financial areas and so yeah. on. Then, then maybe we can uh, see we can crack a, a more competitive market. And mm. I think you know, uh, it's not anti, it's not anti-capitalist or anti-competitive. You're actually promoting the idea of being. That's right. Um, competitive. Yeah, it's, it's the vertical monopoly, isn't it? And uh, there's somebody behind you looking for a microphone. Uh, yes? Yeah. Um, just to take a bit of a left turn on the discussion here. <coughs> oh, go In ahead. terms of what we can um, do with better fibre and, mm. and better speeds, and um, about 10 years ago, so I'm not a lawyer, I'm now working on my own, about 10 years ago we got all the digital dictation things, and we right. thought, brilliant, now we'll be able to... If we're sitting at work, we don't have to have secretaries on call till 9 o'clock at night. If yep. we're sitting at work, we can just download something, call someone, and they can do it. I don't think it's really actually... You know, It's still not very easy to do that now. That's right. Later. So that kind of thing, yep. 
would, it just just changes the way you do work. It does, doesn't it? And and that decentralised model. I, I know of a um, uh, a woman who lives on a farm in central Otago who speaks about eight languages and apparently works for a number of government departments doing translation work because she can. She can stay on the farm and do this work and get paid really rather well, uh, predominantly because of um, uh, broadband capability. Um, now, that's what I'd like to see is, is that um, uh, at the moment, everybody who moves to New Zealand actually moves to Auckland. Uh, we all seem to congregate in Auckland because this is where the work is. Uh, I, you know, I'd be much happier out in Clevedon with a flock of chickens running around, assuming I had, A, enough money to buy a land in Clevedon. But, um, you know, there are plenty of places that um, should be benefiting from this. It doesn't have to be centralised quite so much. Uh, uh, I'll just do my little thing here. I've lost you. There we are. Yeah. Um, the architecture of the CFH requires on the pseudo wire for the data to egress and ingress from the edge of the network for every um, uh, basically line of traffic that's occurring. So if somebody wants to set up a server in their own home at the moment, they have to be able to send the data out of the network, it yep. turns around and comes back to their neighbour. And if you've got 50 <coughs> people all watching, I don't know, 50 megabytes, Yep. A megabits per second, you're getting up to quite a significant load on the ISP server at the edge who's got a particular thing. Right. The, the architecture also provides for the routed multicast and the RF overlay. And the routed multicast is really to capture the clients, and this is the, um, this is the television broadcast issue that, or the tele, tele, television reticulation system that's about capturing uh, people at the edge. Uh, as my friends at various networks know, there is the third way, which is to allow everybody to be able to inject multi, multicast uh, in the network, right. which we have not yet allowed for. Right, The bitstream definition is not there, not provided for. But everything that I'm hearing in terms of allowing the scale up within and allowing the edge, edge supply of yep. uh, sources of data and of uh, content requires this third path. And so I, I believe that the content licensing issue is a very real issue and the ability to repurchase and to provide, but also that enabler so that sports clubs, that local government and all of right, that can right. generate their content. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so uh, there is no standard for that on the UFB at this uh, stage? The Metro Ethernet Forum provides under 33 and 6.1, multi-point yep. to multi-point, multicast optimised. There is no bitstream definition for PON that enables that to occur. Hmm. It is only pseudo-wire and routed multicast. In other words, television broadcast... One way. One, yeah. From yeah. one source point to multiple yeah. leaves and point-to-point pseudo-wire. And it is just doing a uh, configuration of the network. There's no firmware upgrades. There's no change to the network switches. Um, it, is, it is capable of being implemented. Right. Give him a microphone. Yeah. Are you essentially saying that it could be easier than it is? Yes. Right. Um, Hand it on to Josh. So I, I think the whole discussion about we want our um, we want our content on our Apple TVs how we want it. Um, it's a played discussion that's gone on for years, and it's it's kind of boring. Um, we know we want it, so let's just so get let's over just get it. it. But what are we going to actually going to do with this UFB? Yep. Um, which was, I guess, some of the original questions. So. It's going to allow us, hopefully, um, as a business, to collaborate uh, a lot easier. So instead of being able to just being able to work on a, a Google Doc text document, we'll yep. be able to, um, as an architect, you'll be able to have a, a cloud-based set of plans which get shared with the council, which get shared with your engineers, which ah. get shared with everybody working on that plan so yep. that instead of submitting printed drawings to council, they get sent back. They can be marked up in real time yes. online yeah. and you can make those things. Once the building's built... Then that goes into the building information management system. You can control your air conditioning. You can control all of the lighting. You control all of the power. That's the kind of stuff that this fast broadband is really going to yeah. allow. Every device is then connected to the internet, your buildings. You're about to go down. You're about to switch on the underfloor heating on your batch down in Queenstown the day before you go down. How all of these kind of batch in Queenstown. Yeah, I'm all, all of these yep. are all of these kind of things are the more interesting. Yeah. Well, in-laws. We're going down um, to Glenn's place. It's yeah. all right. Yeah. But th those, I, I guess those are the kind of things, so I guess that's, it, it, yeah. none of those are really kind of like 
key kind of business things. The collaboration stuff is, but a lot of the stuff it's like, you know, what are we going to do? I mean, yeah. there's lots of things we can do. I don't think it's one silver bullet, but it's... It, but that's a generational thing, isn't it? That's, that's a long-term view. It's going to be dog's age before you get council clued up enough to be able to integrate all of its systems in the back end. I don't think they talk to each yeah, other North at the Shore, moment. Yeah, but North, Shore, North Shore Council, you could submit your, um, <coughs> your building applications online. Yeah. Archicad are kind of building in the centralised BIM stuff at the moment. So right. the, the pieces are there. It's getting there. Yeah, it's yeah. getting there. But, you know, yeah. being able to move a line on a building and that show up in the engineer's plans... You yeah. should, you, and that's, that is a very good point. A lot of this is going to be money saving, isn't it? And um, it wasn't that long ago, I remember, uh, births, deaths and marriages computerised everything and paid a fortune for the computer system on the promise that things would become cheaper. And then after they'd spent all the money and built this thing, they then put their prices up. And I rang them and said, what on earth is going on? You put your price up. Somebody's got to pay for the computer system. Uh, well, hang on, didn't we already do that? Isn't that, aren't you now more efficient? The is, savings were there, but they disappeared. They I'm, I'm going to jump in. And, Glenn, I love you to death, but I disagree. It's, it's actually about faster porn. Let's all admit it. <laughs> the, the fact is that you know what you're talking about, you know, collaborating on 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 you know on documents with a council or whatever. You could do that today. It's not. It's, it's yeah, but you could do it. It's a technical issue. It's not a technical issue. It's a business issue. You know, I can do, collaborating with with a council on on a plan. There's no difference to no different to collaborating on, on a Google Doc, and I do that all day, every day, across the cloud. I, 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 I believe that those that those that those opportunities could be met under today's connectivity, given the business changes that need to occur. So primarily, these are business these are business issues, not technical issues. And you know, what's the use case? I come back to the same thing. That primarily, it's about faster porn. <laughs> Uploading porn. Oh, let's not go there. So, uh, so, but this is an interesting point, isn't it? That we're I'm predicating a lot of this it. uptake on uh, home users, consumers wanting to sign up for this thing. Uh, we're in effect building a giant mechanism for selling television uh, an awful lot more quickly. But aside from that, once they've got their television really quickly, we're also going to be able to do a whole host of other things that they wouldn't pay for. If you said to everybody, well, we want to um, uh, e-health, you know, to use the minister's ease. Um, uh, we want to do a, an e-health network and every home in the country, you'll all be wired up to the health network and we'll monitor you daily and we'll be able to tell if your granny falls over and breaks her hip. You know, they wouldn't, wouldn't have a bar of it. Uh, what, a health number and health information? Oh, no, I'm not paying for all of that nonsense. I'll just go and see my GP. But they're going to get all of that and a whole bunch of other stuff because we're giving them this, um, this, this whole apparently porn-based network, <laughs> which is quite an interesting concept. Who's got a microphone? Josh. Josh has got a microphone. Uh, hi. Oh, thanks. So um, uh, if you read the New Zealand Herald, apparently I'm here to, uh, to build data centers, and I think that's very amusing. Um, well, I can tell you actually like what I'm actually doing with my connection at home. Okay. So uh, uh, these these things, 3D printers. Um, this is other uh, kind of technology called multi-physics simulation. And that's interesting because... Uh, aside from just using a CAD program to make something, you put in a multi-physics simulator, you can actually see what it does before you build it. Hmm. Um, and the output of that then can be put in a 3D printer, and I've actually done that as a, as a matter of routine. So you have thought something up, drawn it, and then spewed it out of a printer? Yes. Um, and this involves, does involve transferring you know, a bunch of gigs around, around the map. Yep. Um, and uh, I used to do that somewhat more easily where I used to live. It's a little bit more difficult now, and I hope in the near future it's going to be a little, a little bit easier. And certainly it's... Um, it's not the most easy thing to do in the world. It's not like multi-physics wizard. You know, it looks like you're trying to design a thing. Yeah. Like it's not there yet. Yeah. There's no reason why it, it wouldn't be in the near future. And something I also get to, um, a lot of criticism on, people say, oh, well, you just say that because you, know, you, work, you work for that big company that's got lots of computers. Um, big well, G. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll make this kind of weird bet that uh, the cost of computers is going to keep going down, the cost of CPU is going to keep going down. Mm. So it's be routine for people to have that capacity, just not even in the cloud, like in their own home. Um, so they could do what I do or do... You know, do better Whatever they want to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they could do design like multi physics simulated porn or something, too. Um, <laughs> I don't really care about that. Stuff. Haptic porn, I think, is what we're aiming at here for Ben. Uh, so, but that's, you're quite right. So, what we're doing is not just incrementally uh, speeding up the things we do today, we're actually inventing whole new ways of doing things that hopefully if, will deliver. If you don't, um, if suddenly, like your network capacity, you don't have to think about it, then suddenly your entire user's pattern changes. Yeah. The same way that uh, you think about disk. 
um, before we actually used to care about like deleting stuff. Like yeah. now, you know, <laughs> yeah. nobody cares. You just keep filling it up. That's right. I that's just right. asked the question like, what if the constraint went away? If you didn't have to care about your network capacity. And that's what we're building, isn't it? An unconstrained world from this perspective, hopefully. I hope so. Hopefully, yes. Man with a the microphone. There we are from Waiheke Island. Um, I just would like to imagine that perhaps we're possibly going to embark on another way of selling clean and green. And it certainly was, I, I think um, David Shearer was talking this morning about the fact that we've been basically living on the support of a technology that happened 150 years ago yep. in the way that we marketed clean and green. And that the possibility is that as we move into this and when we get competitive international connectivity, ah. one of the things that might occur, I believe is likely to occur, is that the number of people in the world would like to relocate here exactly. for clean and green and create industry from here. Mm. And that in the process of doing that, we will then create a subculture which is starting to make money which will then change our academics from going into law, into tech, and we will Accounting. change our culture yeah. in terms of the way we relate. That's issue one. And issue two, with, with our Asian immigrants and our political stability and our health system and our ability to have voice communication more easily, we can start saying hello to the world and especially to Asia differently and we can fundamentally change this culture in ways that we would never have imagined. Oh, look, I couldn't agree more. And I think, it, as, as Lance says, it is starting to happen, isn't it? We're starting yeah. to see people come here to work. But both. I mean, I think there's a, I'm not the only one here that's returned back to New Zealand from overseas. And every time you, you, someone comes back to New Zealand, they're making a conscious choice. You can stay away or you can come back. And there's mm. some amazing things about this. Um, you know, and then the whole immigrant community in Auckland especially is absolutely incredible. Yep. And, and bringing a whole new dynamicism to, to the country. So, um, yeah, this is a great place to, to work and do business. And over to you, Jamie, to answer the question of why is our internet so damned expensive? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. 20 words or less. Well, I was actually going to... I'll start off with what I was going to say. Um, I mean, if we want to make UFP a success and we want to generate wealth, then we need to export, start exporting stuff. Mm. And that way you start importing dollars. If there's one thing I'd like... Um, to be heard coming out of Net Hui is all of the people that want to use this infrastructure are demanding on every single ISP in the country to stop rating uploaded data. That's both domestically and internationally. Make the ability for us to export stuff at no cost. You go to any ISP in this country and the, 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 the digital freighting system is clogged up inbound. Right? That's what's driving the cost. ISPs buy international capacity, both inbound and outbound. All of us have got a hell of a lot of data on our international links, sitting there doing nothing. The best thing that we can possibly do is unleash that capacity so people can start getting wealthy off the back of it. And all of a sudden, hey, broadband might start becoming more affordable for everyone. Mm. Can somebody tweet that? So you guys buy international capacity symmetrically, is that right? You buy yep. upload as much as download. Yep. And, and of course, <coughs> we, we don't use all of the upload, do we? No. no Nowhere I near. Mean, oh, without making a plug, there's only two ISPs that I know of that have been uh, not rating international outbound for a long period of time. That's us, CFX Networks, and another Wellington ISP, DTS. Mm. I, I think the whole industry should do it. It would be at virtual no cost to the industry. Great. That's an actual outcome. Alice has set up a cage in the States to avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, awesome. But we'll come um, back to that. Apparently Telstra will have no impact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Ro Rowan, you're sitting there very quietly. Um, probably hear from <laughs> He's the, tweeting. Uh, Leave him alone. He's uh, tweeting. The person in charge of strategy for UFB. <laughs> Well, I did finally get Twitter to work, so you could see my tweet up there, but let me, let me amplify a little bit. Um, I, I, I think that um, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, the UFB is enabling infrastructure at the last mile only. It really doesn't solve the problem, which is pretty much what you said at the front hall. Mm. I think the opportunities are huge, um, but they really do probably require each industry, each sector, each supply chain, each sectoral group like schools and so on to have a really adaptive conversation about what step change really is for them. Yeah. And assuming that that comes from people like me, it's just not going to happen. 
we, we don't have the capability, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the scale, and we won't get it right. The government simply wouldn't get things like that right. So while I commend plans like the e-health stuff that the government is working mm -hmm. on in areas where it's got real skills and real leverage and a lot of money um, and a lot of you know, social, social equity requirements, um, at the end of the day, most of it does actually come down to us. And so it'll be different things in different places. I mean, I would love to see um, really good progress on sustainability um, come out of the UFB. So uh, we've talked about working from home, but yeah. you know, in fact, it's the whole decarbonisation or virtualisation of our supply chain that's a massive opportunity for us to be to actually be more clean and green rather than just claiming to be more clean and green. Mm. It's also a measurement thing because, you know, as we I think we talked about the um, things like heating, um, we've seen a lot of fibre operators over the world around the world who are using smart grid technology, home automation, energy management, those types of things. Um, and you have fibre as an enabler of that type of thing. So exactly. Heaps yeah. of opportunities. Lots of opportunities. If you send your microphone that way, I'll talk to this gentleman here. Uh, yeah, if I can just um, <coughs> expand a bit on the um, production side rather than the consumption side. Sure. Um, the companies and people that I've worked with over the last 20 years or so in the internet and digital space who really made significant changes are general people who've turned the limitations and restrictions that they're faced with into positives. Right. And New Zealand has a couple of real structural advantages over a lot of uh, countries and areas and people who um, do have mm. universal fast broadband, who you know are perceived to have a lot better um, access to professionally produ produced long form video content. These are huge advantages to not have easy access to professionally produced long-form video. Right. That means there's an enormous appetite right now that no one is filling for um, non-professionally produced, non-video, non-long-form things. And mm -hmm. if you look at the success stories over the last two or three years in the media space, um, they've been in that category with right. things like uh, Pinterest, Instagram, um, casual gaming on apps. Mm. These are not long form, high bandwidth no, um, no, applications for the, long, uh, exactly. for the most part. There is no reason why New Zealand should not be a leader in this area because you are not being provided the programming you think you're, yeah. uh, you want to be watching. Um, so there's a huge void that should be being filled um, and that there are companies working uh, to fill. Separately, in terms of <coughs> ultra-fast, waiting for ultra-fast mm. um, in a lot of areas is going to be a process of, uh, of years. Having low or medium bandwidth access is actually a huge advantage because um, there are enormous parts of the world that are in the same situation. And also the real consumption, a lot of the real business opportunities worldwide are in mobile. Right. Where people right. are working on much more limited um, yeah. bandwidth. And also for the type of video programming that people routinely complain about. Mm. Um, people want to watch things on the best screen available. They exactly. would prefer not to be watching Game of Thrones on a four-inch screen. Yeah. Um, so there's a huge advantage in being constrained by relatively limited bandwidth. Since you're creating exactly the sort of, you would be creating exactly the sort of programming and yeah. exporting exactly the sort of programming that huge chunks of the world are, number one, technologically only able to mm. get. Um, they're faced with the same constraints on professionally produced long-form video programming. And also it can be optimized for mobile, yeah. which is where um, the biggest part of the growth is in the rest of the world and where the right. revenue opportunities are. Yeah. So turning things that people complain about and things that are perceived as weaknesses into a positive and into an opportunity is something that successful companies have been doing for 20 years in this space. Um, and people who've been trying to either reinvent TV or find an easier way to get the yeah. traditional movies and TV shows um, have you know, had success doing it, but it's not a particularly interesting area to be that, that's right. working in, and it's not something that's um, worth spending billions of dollars of government money. Yeah, on. yeah. And I've been delighted to see the growth in New Zealand of the Game Developers um, Association. I, I, is there anybody here from a Game Developers side of things? No, they're all busy programming stuff at the moment. They are exactly what you say. They are filling that niche, and it's grown exponentially in the last few years. It's, it's really quite remarkable to see. Who's got a microphone? Here we are. Yeah, hi. Um, let me just start and say thanks, Jamie. Appreciate the plug. 100% um, agreed. Um, 
just to go back to your original question, what will we be doing with UFB? Yeah. As an ISP, we'll be trying to get it everywhere we can as fast as we can, but at the same time treading carefully because my, my initial um, experiences with talking UFB with customers is that there are a great number of misconceptions out mm. in the market. People read, read an article in the newspaper that UFB is coming and they seem to think that the governments can open up an office and they can go to counter seven, get a chip, someone will be there at seven o'clock in the morning to inter, you know, yep. install free internet. <laughs> the SLAs that are in place with these services are entirely different from what's in place now with our um, you know, local fiber connections. That's right. um, and it's really important that these messages get put across um, you know, companies like us and FX go to great pains to provide mm. a high-level service for businesses. And if customers have invested a great deal of money in particular applications that they need to run at certain committed speeds, they need to know what the risks are when they're getting exactly. into a UFB uh, scenario. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's going to be quite critical in the next few years is that we explain to consumers and to business alike just what it is that they're buying because otherwise company A offers 100 megabits a second at twice as much as company B. Why would I? It's the same thing, isn't it? It's all just bits, and, and I don't think they get that yet. Yeah. That's, that's right, and I think we, yeah, we'll, we'll have to have a conversation about that because that is going to be critical. Uh, otherwise, we're going to see a lot, of, um, a lot of trouble in the next few years. Yeah, on the um, on the shift between you know from what we've got now to UFB and how we use it, I would if, if we shift back maybe 10, 15 years and we take a look at what we do now differently because we've got ADSL and BDSL mm. as opposed to what we had with dial-up. Oh. I bet we had no idea that we would be using things like Google Docs and um, YouTube Absolutely. would exist and Trade Me would, would exist Skype. And, and Skype and all the rest of it. Yep. But, we didn't shift from dial-up to ADSL because we had a vision of all of these things and we thought, well, let's go build ADSL. And in the same way, I think UFB, you know, I've got my concerns and, you know, I think there's a whole lot of things that we think about it that probably aren't necessarily true. But what I do look forward to is in 10 years, there will be stuff that we'll be doing that we couldn't have done without UFB, but we don't see it in the future right yeah, now. Yeah. Having said that, a lot of the things that we do think we'll do with UFB we could be doing now with ADSL and even 3G. So smart grids in your house, you can do that now. Yeah. Um, I do agree with, with Ben over here, collaboration on, on um, engineering reports. and stuff. That's just screen rendering. You can do that on, on, on ADSL, et cetera now. And then uh, with the gentleman in the, in the front, I think uh, the FX guy and, and, a, and a friend over here from DTS, uploaded, um, uploading international Absolutely, and if we can get more content in New Zealand to export out outwards, then international prices will come down even faster than mm. now. We blame international um, pricing for the reason that New Zealand internet is expensive in New Zealand. I don't actually think that's the case. The international price has been coming down incredibly fast over the last five years, um, and I'm thinking in an order of magnitude of, of six times. Uh, if we can get more data in New Zealand to push out, more and more that will just keep on coming down and coming down and then we'll start looking at our friends at Chorus as to maybe why our pricing is very high. Right, right. So international is not the, uh, the, the bottleneck that we... Because we, uh, that's what we talk about an awful lot. Well, it, it, having two pipes would be great, but I think more from a technical redundancy perspective and, and to create some more competition. And there is yeah, quite a lot economic of drive. competition at the moment. Um, more is always better and the mm. company that I now represent is, is very much... Um, trying to be as aggressive as possible to, to drive that, that pricing down even further. Um, but getting more, getting more pipes across you know, the ocean, technically fantastic, competition-wise, bring it on. We need to do some, some things for yeah. New Zealand. And I think you know, communities versus some of, the, some of the big boys can do some really good things for the New Zealand public. Absolutely. We'll give you a microphone. I'm a, I've lost the other one. I'll just go back to Lance's question before. Um, one of the things that happened, that one of the things that was happening pre the advent of Pacific Fibre, is ISPs were taking very, very long-term contracts. You know, mm. you know, in some cases, two to three years, in terms of supply contracts. And that, the reason why they did that was to get the price optimised as much as they could. Um, and then, you know, Pacific Fibre's come about, and we've seen international prices start tumbling. <laughs> the issue is, is that some of the ISPs are still on those long-term contracts, so you could see a, a two to three year time frame for those, those wholesale changes right. to come through in the retail. Right. And that's got to be a concern. 
folded into all of this, though, is the demand just keeps accelerating up at an at a exponential rate. And whether you use 35, 50, or 100%, I've heard all these numbers, um, the price will always keep going down. Um, and, and because it, it has to, because the demand goes up at this exponential rate. The problem is, if you don't have competition, um, then the price stops going down. And we've seen that. We've seen that. We've mm. seen the history. Um, so, um, you know, it's great that we've got competition in the market right now. Um, let's, you know, I guess from a from my own perspective, I don't care if I'm not even part of the deal in the end. I just want another pipe. That's why we started this thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, just back, I, I agree that like uh, 10 years ago, yeah, we didn't know what we'd be doing now. Um, uh, that's good, but I, I still think this whole collaboration thing, you know, say, yeah, you, can, you can do it now. You can do all this home automation stuff over 3G or, or ADSL. But the experience, that there's a mindset there that we don't have ubiquitous connection and stuff like that. So in 10 years' time, we'll be able to do those things well, you know, and you'll be able to collaborate on drawings and it won't be a sucky experience. It'll yeah, actually yeah. be a really good experience. Whereas now it may not be such a good experience. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And and just a, another thought of things that we could do with uh, how this whole infrastructure. Um, I, there's probably massive uh, things for farming. Um, I think you know if we can if farmers yeah. have UAV, the cost of UAVs is coming down to like a thousand bucks. If they can be thrown up a UAV every day that's flying and monitoring their pastures, and that's then been uploaded that's to right. some crop management system that's hosted in the cloud, um, we should be able to reduce the. Uh, yeah. Increase the efficiency of our farming and things like that. There's that's that's right, hugely. That we just don't and and the benefits control. to New Zealand of the, as a whole of a couple of percent uh, of uh, of um, uh, improvement in the farming sector is tremendous. It is a huge amount of money, and I do, I do have somebody waiting patiently in the back. Oh, I, <laughs> dive I, on in. Um, my name's Suzanne Kendrick, and I live in Greylin, and I'm part of the Greylin Business Association. We won't hold that against you. <laughs> and. Um, you know, you're all talking about the future, but I'll just tell you what's happening in Greyland right now. Um, most people in our business association work from home. Most people are corporate refugees. They've been in the sector. <laughs> They're now working from their house. Um, like Alistair said, they could easily go into town and get an office, but why would you? Yeah. We can see the street being dug up by Chorus right now. We're getting UFB soon. Um, you know, and everyone's working from home, the cafes. Why are there so many cafes in Greyland? Because they're packed mm. with people working the whole time, doing business, doing lunch, whatever. And um, it's already happening right now. And UFB will just, I think, further mean the social trend of people be working for themselves. And, and like my street alone, there's a video producer, PR, graphic designer, I do online marketing, a health consultant, all work from home. Mm. And for women, the sort of, you know, the thing that you always want is this work-life balance. And, and we're not all women, but a lot of women do work from home because now we have work-life balance. So yep. why would you give that up when you get oh, everything? Absolutely. You know, you get yeah, your yeah. kids drop the bag and they go off and play and you yep. just keep doing what you're doing yeah, and, exactly. and you get what you wanted. So it's, it's fantastic because um, we've got the work-life balance. We're lucky enough to have the skills yep. we can work for ourselves. And the internet, you know, has meant that that's all been possible. So why would we give that up and go back and that, work that, for that's corporate right. that's when right. you're, you know, you're getting everything you want yeah. right now? And the UFB just means that that it enables that to for grow. a lot more totally. people, doesn't it? I yeah. mean, yeah, I, I work from home as well these days, and um, children and shouting at each other over the Chris, over the, uh, the the school holidays aside, yeah, uh, exactly. it's tremendous. I don't have the commute. I'm not adding to pollution. Uh, Travelling backwards and forwards to sit in an office and do what I can do sitting at home. Mm. So, and I also buy an awful lot of coffee. You're quite right. Uh, and, and rolling that out to the rest of the uh, to the rest of the country, I think that we might start to see some uh, some pick up there as well uh, outside of these pockets of um, of capability at the moment. So, there's Andrew's got a microphone. Hi everyone. My name's Andrew. My employment situation is uncertain. It's irrelevant to my comments oh. anyway. Um, <laughs> what I, I want to try be a how can I put it crotchety optimist in this? Come on, you're the youngest crotchety old man I know. Thank you. Get into um, it. Because uh, me, from my point of view, I, I resent somewhat that there is, by my rough maths, $1,500 per household of, of our public money 
being poured into something that all I hear so far today is that we might be able to download porn a little bit faster, or you might get to work from home a little bit more. There are <laughs> yeah. a lot. Oh, so, I'm sorry, it'll be massively faster. Streaming, streaming. Now, the one piece of inspiration that I take from this today is the well-made point that we don't know what we'll be able to do with this technology until we've got it. And I want to flip that around to a little bit of a challenge, because I suspect that in a technically minded conference like what we have here today, it was the people in a room such as this that was very loud mouthed when this idea came up about investing in UFB, right? And I also suspect that it's people like you in this room that now have to find a reason in which we can justify that investment. <laughs> Now, I haven't heard too many good justifications for that style of investment so far today. I'm sure you'll all find a way to prove me wrong over the next 10 years. Uh, I would hope so. Otherwise, you're entirely within your rights to come and kick us all in the butt. Um, if you pass the microphone on, Jordan's looking for one. No, Jordan's got a microphone, and I do have to get to Colin as well before I forget. Jordan. Um, thanks, Paul, and I'm not crotchety, um, <laughs> though I'm only a little bit older than Andrew's. Um, it relates, actually, follows on a little bit. We've got this new infrastructure that we're laying, right? And it's fiber optic cable. Fiber optics can carry lots of data really quickly, but the entry-level plans that we've built, and I'm not going to get political about why that might be the case, are actually quite slow in some mm. respects. So... Um, in terms of the use, some of the studies I've seen indicate that when you get symmetrical connectivity in place, people start to really change what they do. So if we've turned the UFB into a kind of glorified ADSL network, which comes down fast and lets you get your porn or whatever quickly, but doesn't let you be the home producer that you might be, and if we know that, in theory, having symmetrical connectivity really is the thing that changes stuff, the question I've got for the people who are thinking about new services is, is that a mistake that we're going to need to fix at some point in the future? Is symmetrical, the symmetrical nature of future high-speed connectivity what is a missing link in terms of new offerings or not? It's, I, I just don't know the answer. My instinct is that it might be but I'm not the guy making the services. So, yeah, you're quite right. Is, uh, is the need for broadband, um, is the need for symmetrical broadband as important or more important than the need just for pure speed? And I think you might be right. Certainly going from upload at the moment, I'm on ADSL2 and I get 15 meg down but only about one up. Uh, going to 10 up would be a tremendous leap. Um, but I, th I think there's something in there, yeah, we'll, we'll need to start looking at symmetrical quite quickly if we are to be more than just consumers. Yeah, well, I just want to follow that up, that I'm quietly working on my own business model, which depends entirely upon good upload and price competitive. Mm. And I'm just still having to wait until that gets on stream. Um, and, and that's a video-based yeah. export service. And, and at the present time, um, ADSL can't do it. No, no. And without price competitive international connectivity, I still don't know exactly how that well can do it. So yep. to me, we aren't in the ball game until we've got price competitive symmetric. It, that's right, and, and I think we might be onto something there because uh, I, I, talking to some of the film uh, producers a, a couple of years ago for a white paper, uh, they were um, losing out on business in New Zealand because they could not send the rushes of the day's filming to LA or Germany overnight because the upload speed uh, and capability simply wasn't there. Well, it was there, they just couldn't access it. So it, it is a big issue. Colin uh, has some to add in, so I'll gesture over your way. I don't know who's got the microphones back there. Okay, this is just a very... It's not, it's not really a shout-out. My name's Colin Wallace from, uh, from DIA. I'm not speaking on behalf of Internal Affairs, uh, but uh, Paul's been very uh, kind to just give me the microphone for a little moment. I, I work in... Uh, I'm right to... Just in case you... I mean, many of you won't know, on, you know there's a hierarchy in, in the public service. Uh, and uh, so I'm right down at the bottom of it, so don't think that I'm manager or anything. But I do uh, operate on in international standards a lot. And one of the things about international standards that's really misunderstood is you think it's a geeky and technical thing, when in fact, actually, the motivation for standards is very much a, a policy and strategy play. And so when I, when I look at the internet economy in New Zealand, I start to look at it in a policy and strategy in play. And I certainly am not the only one in this room who will have understood just how much value has come out of these two days. 
what I'm saying now is, um, and I'm about to say, is really uh, for those people who are uh, leaving us today, not at the bar camp tomorrow, where the subject I'm about to bring up is going to be uh, is going to be discussed. So this is really a shout out, particularly to people leaving today, and uh, that's really about. Um, what you've seen today in this room, even, is we're, we're an ecosystem, a little, it's a UFB ecosystem. It's a part of the internet, and next door there's another part, and next door, and next door. They're all little parts, they're all little mini ecosystems. Quite advanced like this one, perhaps not so advanced in others. And there's just ideas. There's ideas in this room which actually should be captured. Of course they are on the Twitter feed, and just they, they can be on the, on the email and so on. And remember that Nat was talking this morning about, um, you know, uh, well, go do some networking, uh, make sure you don't, you know, you don't lose the opportunity. My sense is I, I think that that's great, but I think it could be extended. I think we have the ability here, we have so many really superb ideas, it's just too much of a risk to let them drop, to let them, to let them be forgotten, to be brought up again next year. We are small as a country, small is beautiful in this case, because we have the opportunity just at this moment where we're both small and our internet maturity is getting to that point where we really we can have you know, very adult conversations about where the internet's going. We have the opportunity to bring those siloed um, ecosystems, if you like, together in New Zealand, bring them together to actually really get some synergies into the internet economy in New Zealand. But to do that, we're going to need just a little bit more than one conference, one really good conference once a year, mm. and you know a little bit of Twitter feed and, a little, and an email list. We need just a wee bit more infrastructure. There are different ways of doing that. Maybe NetHui just changes its, its uh, stance and becomes something over, you know, that's not just once a year and becomes a little more uh, persistent than that. Or perhaps it's another company stepping up and, uh, and offering just the, the vaguest of interest infrastructure, some wiki, some email lists, maybe some, from, some phone lines. But just think about, if I, for those people particularly leaving, um, uh, today. Just have a think about the value you've got out of this uh, last two days and how we must, first of all, capture it, move it forward, actually get the deliverables out of it that we so dearly want for the advancement of the internet economy in New Zealand. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Colin. And uh, I think Vikram's talked about um, doing just that in, uh, in uh, the months ahead, is having a look at Net Hui and how it functions, and whether we have micro ones around the region, or um, how it evolves from this point on. So I, I fear we're all out of time at the moment. So I'd like to thank you all for coming along. Uh, I've actually got an action point, which is tremendous, and uh, it's the first one I've picked up so far. So I will be following up on upload capacity and uh, what our ISPs are doing about that. But I hope you got something out of it as well. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm all out of chubba chups, but I know there's someone over here needs a hug, so we can sort that out at afternoon tea. Uh, so just a five-minute changeover, and Lance is going to be facilitating the, the next session.